I'm going to record, start recording. Okay, let's get started, guys. I'm going to stop my video. All right. All right, let's come together. 12 o'clock. We've got uh, the class gets smaller and smaller, but I'm sure people are going to join in as the, as the time goes by. It is a Friday. Yeah, this is it's pretty close. You're right. You're right. Um, yeah, so a couple of announcements. Homework seven is gonna be due next Wednesday, right? Always the same thing. There was an extension on homework six. I got like three or four different people reporting that grade scope was down for some amount of time or something. So I just went ahead and gave you guys a two day extension to the whole class. So that's due today at midnight, I believe, all right? So if you're still working on it, you know, make changes, submit it. Uh, homework seven is out, yeah. For the what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give extra credit for that, why not? Um, what is a good way for me to confirm you guys attended the hackathon? When, when you win, okay. Yeah, if you win, you get even extra credit, yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. If you guys, if you guys go to the hackathon, uh, I'll give you guys extra credit for the class. Maybe like one percent or something, half a percent. I don't know. All right. Sure. Like I, I mean, like uh, it, uh, just a little bit of extra credit. Okay, guys, don't don't go crazy. You're not you're not gonna go from failing to passing by going to the hackathon. Okay, but. <laughs> But, but it, it, might, it might help you out a little bit, so try it out. Okay, on Monday, uh, I'm actually out, so I'm not gonna be here in person, uh, but we still have a lecture. Uh, I'm on a research trip, so I'll, I'll, I, I won't be here Monday, but I wanted to pull you guys, because you're in person, so you guys get to decide, I guess. Um, here's a couple of options. So option one is Monday can be a work day uh, with Chi here as a TA, and it can just be like a off hours. So you guys are working on your homework. Option two is I can join remotely. So I, I will just not be in Greensboro, but I, can, I will have time to join. So I can join remotely and give the lecture remotely like all over Zoom. She will set it up. And if you guys have questions, you can like ask me while I'm trying to teach remotely. Well, we can try that out. And then option three is I can just record the lecture and be say, during this hour, at some point, you guys should watch this recorded lecture. So then we continue. So, um, what are, uh, who has a preference for option three? Uh, you guys realize that if, if, if we miss a lecture, you will learn, you will end up covering less material. That's all I'm saying, right? There's only so many lectures in the, in, in the semester. Just keep that in mind. No preference. Okay. Yeah. Question. Uh, oh, so like a mix of one and three. Uh, yeah, I can, I can do that if you guys want to. Like I'm, yeah, the recording a lecture is not, far. I've already got the slides and everything. So, As a, but then, but then you guys have to like watch it, right? You have to make the time to watch it. Okay. Um, all right. So, okay. So a mixture of option one and three, where we have a work day in class. I'm going to ask Chi to be here. I won't be here, but you guys can just work on your homework here. Um, and then I will also release a recorded version of the lecture, which is going to cover more dynamic programming that you guys are responsible for watching on your own time at some point. Is that is that whatever? Okay, cool. Um, all right, thank you guys. I appreciate the flexibility here, um, and I'll let you guys know how uh, how the trip goes. All right. Yes. Come. Uh, so I'm actually going to Houston. Uh, there's a small research conference there to just, uh, yeah, I'm actually just watching the research conference. I'm not presenting anything. I don't have any research. Yeah. Up, oh, yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, I usually, I'm, I'm actually leaving on Friday. I'm actually leaving later today and then I'll be there the weekend. Yeah. Huh? Camp? Camp with a K. Okay. Let's jot that down.
Okay, um, that's great. Yeah, is anybody here from Houston? I guess, are you, is that? But you've been there, okay. All right, so uh, I will keep you guys updated. I appreciate the flexibility and it sounds like we're gonna do a work day, but I will also release the recorded lecture. Please watch it. Okay, great. All right, so today we have a lot of stuff to cover. Pretty exciting, dynamic programming is very fun. And I will preface this with a little caveat. Uh, you don't see a lot of dynamic programming questions in interviews because they tend to be harder. Uh, but you, some of the, like Snap, for example, is very well known for liking to ask dynamic programming questions. Uh, Google sometimes does this as well, but more for their like full-time hires rather than their um, intern, intern hires, okay? All right, so last time we talked, we introduced a little bit of dynamic programming. You guys remember um, the Fibonacci, right? How we computed Fibonacci. We stored the answers in an array. We built it up step by step, okay? Um, we talked about the name. So dynamic programming does not mean you are coding dynamically like in a movie. It just, it's just the name somebody picked because they could get more money from the government that way, okay? Uh, Again, dynamic programming is an algorithm design paradigm. Okay, so it's not like a solution. It's not a specific algorithm that we're going to cover. It is just a way to think about problems and how to solve them efficiently. Okay, so it's similar to divide and conquer. It's not going to be like, here is the answer, right? It's not merge sort or something. Uh, so the way we're going to teach this concept is we're actually just going to go through a lot of examples. Okay, so we're going to talk about a couple of very common problems. But here's the basic idea for dynamic programming. When you have a problem, usually where you're trying to optimize something, like trying to find the maximum, the minimum, uh, trying to find the shortest path, the longest path, where you're trying to do something where you're trying to find the most optimal solution, uh, that is a good candidate for dynamic programming. The very first step you want to do is you want to find some optimal substructure. So what that means is that your problem can be solved by knowing the answer to a smaller problem, like the optimal answer, right? So the shortest path problem, if I know the, sh if I, no, um, the short, so the shortest path from S to T, if I know the shortest path from S to the node right before T, then that helps me get the answer that's the shortest path from S all the way to T, right? Uh, take advantage, the other thing that dynamic programming does, so this optimal substructure should sound familiar. This is also what you're looking for in a divide and conquer algorithm. It is also what you're looking for in a greedy algorithm, which we're gonna cover uh, on Monday lecture, actually. Um, but one of the reasons dynamic programming can be a lot better is if you have sub problems that overlap a lot, right? So again, like Fibonacci, right? To calculate the nth Fibonacci, you need to calculate n, n minus one and n minus two, right? But to calculate n minus one, you also need to calculate n minus two, right? So there's like overlap between all the different uh, answers. And then the idea is that since there's so much overlap, what you try to do is you try to solve each problem only once and then save the answer. And if you ever need it again in the future, you just look it up in a table, right? Cool. So today uh, we're gonna go through a few examples of dynamic programming. Again, so the dynamic program is a paradigm. You should guys keep in mind this idea of like we have a problem. We're trying to identify optimal substructure. We're gonna try to save our answers and then we're gonna code that up, okay? So the first example is Floyd Warshall. Uh, I've never seen this in an interview. You don't, I mean, you know, just FYI, but uh, this is the problem of solving the all pairs shortest path. Okay, so we talked about uh, Bellman Ford, we talked about Dijkstra, we talked about BFS. All of those were solving the single source shortest path problem. So if I start at S, what is the shortest path to any of the nodes in my graph? All right. How would you guys currently solve the all pairs shortest path problem? So given a graph, what is the shortest path between all possible pairs? Any suggestions? So you know how to solve the problem from a single source. So Bellman Ford, for example, will tell you from node S, this is the shortest path to all other nodes. Now the problem that we're trying to solve now is not just for node S, but for every node, what is the shortest path between all nodes? So does the problem make sense? Or yeah, David? Yeah. 
Yeah. So again, you guys should not try to be super clever with the algorithms. Okay. That, that is not Floyd Warshaw. Floyd Warshaw is being a little bit more clever, but you do already have a solution to this problem, which is if I know, if I can, I can run Bellman Ford starting from S to get shortest path to all of all the nodes from S. Well, then I just run Bellman Ford from each node and that will give me the shortest path from all pairs, right? Uh, another problem with dynamic programming is called the longest common subsequence. Uh, this is very popular in interview questions. Um, the ones that use dynamic programming anyway, which are not that common, but yeah. Another problem we're gonna cover is called the knapsack problem. Uh, so uh, we're, I'm gonna describe these in detail. I'm just giving you an overview for today. And there's actually two versions of this problem. If we have time, we're gonna cover both of them. If we don't have time, I'll leave the slides there so you guys can look at it for reference. Uh, there are a lot of examples of dynamic programming. So this is the recommended textbook for this class. I usually link out, it's, it's a free textbook. You can find it online, like you can find a PDF. Um, if you wanna get better with dynamic programming, really the best way to do it is just to look at a lot of different problems that use dynamic programming. So there's a lot of other ones. So optimal order of matrix multiplication, you can solve dynamic programming, optimal binary search trees, and longest path in a directed acyclic graph. Okay, so the goal of this lecture is that you guys are hopefully gonna get really bored with dynamic programming. You should not be afraid of it. It is a hard concept, but there is a formula for it. So you should hopefully get bored at the end of this where you're like, I know how to do it. Okay, stop talking to me about dynamic programming. All right, so let's cover Floyd Warshall. Okay, like I said, this is an algorithm for the all pairs shortest paths. Okay, that is, I wanna know the shortest path from U to V for all pairs of vertices in my graph, not just from special single source S. Okay. Uh, here's an example where like basically what you imagine is you imagine your answer is this table where for every single pair, you tell me what's the shortest distance between them. So from S to S, it's zero. From S to U, the shortest distance is two. From S to V, it's four. From U to U, it's zero. From U to S, it's one. From U to V, right? So you're looking for all pairs, okay? Uh, so the naive solution, which you guys just came up with, Right, so this is a perfectly fine solution. Is for every node in G, run Bellman Ford starting at that node, right? Because you guys already know Bellman Ford, you're familiar with that algorithm. The running time of that algorithm is going to be nm, because that's the running time of Bellman Ford, right? We have two for loops over the edges and over the nodes, times n, because you run it each time for every one of those. So the total running time is n squared m. m can be at most n squared, right? The number of edges at most n squared in the graph. So the running time of this solution is actually n to the fourth, which is pretty bad, but it's a good solution. And honestly, Floyd Warshall is not that much better. It's n cubed. So you already have a pretty good solution even though so you, yeah. So the question would be, can you do better? Yes, yes, you can do better. So one thing to consider is you wanna talk about like what is the optimal substructure of all pair shortest path, okay? So, the first thing we do is we take our graph and we consider numbering all of the nodes, right? From we want to identify them in some way. So we give them a numbering. Okay, it doesn't matter how you order them, it's just you give them some number so you can talk about a specific node. Okay. So like node one, node two, node three, all the way up to node n, because you have n nodes. Okay. And I'm gonna live out some edges. Okay, this is a cartoon, it's just an example. But one thing to note is that for all pairs uv to find the cost of the shortest path from u to v, this is the sub problem that we're going to try to solve. Okay, so usually this is the hardest part in a dynamic pro programming problem is coming up with what is the sub problem you're going to try to solve. Okay, so in this case, the sub problem, you know, our original problem is giving me the shortest path for all pairs uv. The sub problem is going to be give me the shortest path for all pairs UV, such that the internal nodes on that path are the nodes from one to K minus one. They can only be those nodes, okay? Does that make sense? A little bit? I'll show, I'll show you as an example. So what this is saying is, these are the vertices one through K minus one. We labeled them in some arbitrary way. And our problem now is how do I find the shortest path from U to V 
that only uses these vertices. It cannot use this one, it cannot use this one, it cannot use this one, okay? At the beginning, we're gonna say, what is the shortest path from U to V that uses no vertices? So the answer to that is simple, right? Because if there's an edge, that is the shortest path. If there's not an edge, the shortest path is infinite, right? So that's like our base case, that's where we start. And then you can, and then what we're gonna show is that if I have the answer to this problem for some K minus one, it is very easy to find the answer when I make it one bigger, right? So for example, this would be the shortest path from U to V only using K minus one. So this might not be the shortest path in the whole graph, okay? But this is the shortest path that only uses these nodes. Yeah. Yeah, only yeah, only the internal nodes. Yeah, so I, the U and the V are outside, and we're saying we are going to find the shortest path from U to V. Okay that only uses the nodes one, two, three, four, five, up to K minus one, okay? Where K is actually gonna start at one. So we're, at the beginning, we're gonna use no nodes in between. We're gonna say the shortest path is either you have an edge and that's the weight of your path, or you have no edge between U to V and the shortest path is infinite because we're not, we're not we don't wanna answer what is the shortest path in the whole graph. We're only answering what is the shortest path that has to go through these through this small subset of the graph. Yes, all these edges could be weighted, they could be negative, they could be whatever. Um, yes, in, in this sense, you, if you imagine, you could imagine like this, this, this is just a cartoon, but you would imagine this is the shortest path because you know maybe, the edge, maybe there's an edge from two and then from two to V, but that weight is bigger and it was actually better to go to K minus one first, right? But the idea is now what you try to do is like, okay, so the, the very, the reason dynamic programming is hard is because coming up with this sub problem is not obvious. But once you see many examples, you're like, you have ideas how to come up with some problems, okay? So again, the sub problem, the thing we changed from the original problem is we said, instead of finding the shortest path from U to V, we're gonna find the shortest path from U to V that only uses these nodes, right? That's how we make our problem smaller in a sense, okay? And what you notice, the reason this is a good subproblem is let's say I know the shortest path that only uses K minus one. What is the shortest path that uses the nodes from one up to K? Yeah. K in this case is just a useful index for us. So it is not given to you, but we're gonna have a for loop in our implementation that goes from one to N. And then we're calling K, um, it's like a, it starts at zero, it goes to one, it goes to two, it goes to three. Because first you solve the problem where like, what is the shortest path if I can't use any nodes in between? Then you say, once I know the answer to all those problems, it's very easy to go, what is the shortest path that only uses node one in between? Whatever node one happens to be, some ordering. And then you go like, oh, what's the shortest path? Like now I know the answer to all those problems. What's the shortest path that uses node one and two? Or not, not it doesn't have to use it, but it can use it, okay? So given that you, know, so again, then this is talking abstractly. We're talking about just K as in some, so you're somewhere in the algorithm. You're like part way through it. You've already solved this problem. So you know this is the shortest path that uses only nodes from one to k minus one. Okay, it does not have to use k minus one. It's just, it could use it if it wants to, but it doesn't have to. Now the question is, how do I use this answer to figure out what is the shortest path that can use k as well? It doesn't have to use k if it doesn't need to, but it could use k. Any idea? There's actually two cases. Here are the two cases. So this is this is this syntax. That's what this, the question I just asked you guys. It's this syntax, but I'm just using different syntax. So we're trying to say if I know the answer for this, how do I come up with the answer for this slightly bigger problem? Okay, slightly bigger. 
there's two cases, okay? It's actually pretty simple. Your shortest path uses K, so it has K in it, or it doesn't. Those are the two options. If it does not have K in it, what is the shortest path? The previous one. Your previous path, if your shortest path does not have K in it, it can use it, but it doesn't have it in it, then your previous one is your shortest path, right? That can use K, but it didn't because it wasn't shorter. What's the other option? It does have K in it, which means there's a path from U to K and then from K to V, right? So case one is we don't need vertex K. So that means the shortest path is the previous path, okay? So our answer is just equal to what we had before. We don't change anything. Yeah. It's, yeah. So if you want to, you can think of K as just being, uh, think of it as being five here. So you have nodes one, two, three, four. So you start with, you can only use those four nodes. Those are the only four you can use. And, it's, and, and now you know the shortest path is to go to three, then to one, then to four, then to V. You just know that, you already know that. Let's assume you know that, right? Then the question is like, well, now I can also use node five. It is an option for me now, okay? Well, there's two cases. In the first case, there is a shorter path that goes through K, right? That goes through five. The other case is the shorter, like the path does not go through five. But if it doesn't go through five, then the original path I had is the shortest one, right? So yeah, if you're getting confused with K, just think about it as like five, is the game, right? Um, like we said, case two is that your shorter path actually use this k right so in that case it looks something like this right so somehow you go to k and then from k you go to v right but here's the interesting thing you already know the answer to this problem because this is the shortest path from u to k that only uses vertices from k minus one and this is the shortest path from K to V that only uses vertices in this smaller circle. Yeah, you're essentially trying to figure out where does K fit in between. And for the second case, the answer would be, if this was shorter, the answer would be, um, yeah, we basically talked about this. Right. So this is what I was saying that you actually know, you know the answer to this path because it's a smaller sub problem. Does that make sense? So if you have these two cases, it could either be this or it could be this, and you're trying to find the minimum, what would you do? Just call in on the two answers and take whichever one is smaller. Okay. And that is the dynamic programming approach. So the shortest path from U to V that uses nodes from one through K is equal to the minimum of, I either used K, which is this value. Sorry, I didn't use K, which is what I had before, or the distance from U to K using only K minus one plus the distance from K to V using only K minus one, right? And the, the idea, the reason this works is that because all of these are minus one, you already have the answer to this, right? So when I'm trying to solve, what is the shortest distance from U to V that only uses node one, I already have the answer to all the shortest distances that only use no nodes between them, zero, right? So that helps me solve for the one case. Once I have all the ones for the one case, I can solve for the two case because it's just the sum of ones, one cases, right? So like I said, this was case one, also the shortest path through one, one through K minus one. This is case two. And then what you do is you basically, you try both of them and you take the minimum, okay? So this is what we call optimal substructure. We can solve a big problem, a bigger problem, right? K 
okay using the answers to smaller problems. Okay. Now, the other thing that the reason this is really good for dynamic programming is there's a lot of overlapping subproblems. A lot of shortest paths might be reused by other shorter paths. So we use dynamic programming. So this actually, you are now done. This actually gives you an algorithm to solve the all pair shortest path problem. Okay. What does this look like? This is what we call the Floyd Warshall algorithm. We initialize n by n arrays. So each array is n by n. We call them dk for k from zero to n. Okay. So we're going to keep all of these matrices. Now, the shortest distance from u to u is always zero for every node, no matter the value of k, right? Because you can always get to yourself. These are the base cases, basically. The shortest distance from u to v, u to v is infinity for every value of k to start with, right? For all u not equal to v. So for all nodes that are not themselves, we're going to initialize to if you. So if you imagine these matrices. If you're connected to yourself, it's zero. Otherwise, it's infinity. That's to initialize. Then um, for k equals zero, we know the answer. So if I cannot use any nodes in between me and the node I'm trying to get to, then the shortest distance is going to be the weight of the edge between me and that node. If there is no edge, we say that the weight is infinity. Right? Does that make sense? So does this make sense where we solved it for the zero case? Yes? OK. Then all you do is you say, starting with k equal to 1, right? So I want to solve for the 1 case first. Consider all pairs of nodes and solve it for the k equal to 1. So this is going to be d of 1 uv is going to be the minimum of d0, d0, d0. So you already have the answers to these. You're just going to take the minimum of the two options. That's going to give you the answer to D1. And then you're going to go on to K equal 2. And you notice K equal 2 is only going to depend on K equal 1, K equal 1, K equal 1. And you already have the answer to K equal 1. Right? So this for loop, once it's done, it's going to fill up your entire matrix. Okay. So the very last one you're going to turn is D where K equal to N, right? Yeah. When you have a matrix, uh, we use infinity usually for representing if there's no edges between, if there's no path that is connecting the nodes given the restrictions we've imposed, the matrix will be infinity. But that actually just comes from us setting it to infinity. We set all of them to infinity at the very beginning. But in C++, you might use math.infinity. You might use null pointer if you want. Um, you can use like optionals and use like null option. Like there's many different ways to implement it. But just something that says this value is either not possible or like we haven't gotten to it yet, right? And then you can imagine like when you take the min, right, in C++, uh, if you're using infinity, I think this will work. But if you're using negative one, then like you have to check, you know, it's like if it's negative one, then I, I just take the other answer, right? Because I don't want actually want to take the answer. Do you guys understand this algorithm? Yeah. Yeah, so this is pretty, this is like a, this is a 3D matrix. You have a D for every K value. And then each k value has a two by like an n by n matrix, right? So that's why like you you have three indices, right? You have your source, your destination, and then k. So this matrix here is actually n by n. K is saying. Um, this k is just we order we decided a numbering for the vertices from one to n right some arbitrary ordering it actually doesn't matter and then k is saying okay the shortest path can either go through node k or it cannot and then it just considers the case where like you know i do i go through node one or not 
that and the shortest path can be answered by knowing do you go through no nodes and then it says do i go through node one or two and that can actually be answered by looking at do i go through node one only right um uh, this is a dynamic programming algorithm so this is called a bottom-up dynamic programming algorithm yeah yeah Yes, that is saying it, the shortest path from U to V. So this K represents the shortest, the that uses nodes one, that can use nodes one through K in between, right? So one through K, right? So that was the drawing that we had before, where it's like, oh, you know, I, I can I can use nodes one, two, three, four, and five. Not any, I can't use any other nodes. The six, I cannot use node six, okay? You will check it because eventually you'll get to k equals six, right? The idea is that the reason you return d of n is what? What does this answer? This says what is the shortest distance between u and v that can use the nodes one through n? Oh, so you're really just, uh, yeah. You're bu you're bu you're building it up slowly. Okay, so I'll, I'll encourage you guys to think about this algorithm. This is pretty. This is this is what you do with dynamic programming. We're gonna see some more. Okay. Yeah. Question? Yeah. You I mean, okay, so to finish answering your question from before, this DK thing, the shortest distance from U to V that only uses the nodes one through K in the path, right? So one through five, is either the shortest distance that uses only the nodes one through four, which means I didn't use node five, or the shortest distance from U to K that does not use node five, right? Plus from K to V that does not. So this is this is the case where I do use five. And if you use five, that means you have to get to five without using five, right? And then you have to get from five to V without using five. Yeah. Um, they're just ways to index into yeah so in c plus plus you would probably close it here and close it here you, this would be like a vector of vectors yeah um oh this this is looking up your answer this is looking up your answer in this matrix it is just indexing input so this answer this is not calling yourself recursively you actually already know you already have this value right because at the very beginning, we set D0 UV, right? So for all UV, so for all edges, we set it to the weight. So at the very, very beginning, when you look, you know, when you're trying to compute for K equal one, this is gonna, this is gonna be D0 of UK. So basically it's gonna say, is there an edge from U to K? If it is, then it's gonna be that number. Otherwise it's gonna be infinity, right? At, yeah, at D0, at D0. At D0. And then the key idea is that you know the answer for k equals zero. You just know it because it's you're not you 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 have to be directly connected. You cannot have any nodes in between, right? So but to compute the answer for k equal one, you actually only need the answer for k equals zero. And then similarly, you know, to compute the answer for k, you only need the answers for k minus one. So you can see that like you're building it up. So you're, you're not calling yourself, this is no work, this is constant work. This is just looking it up. This is constant work, this is constant work. It's not called. Yes, yes, the path, the path. Without, so it's not that it's the path, yep. Uh, so this is called bottom-up dynamic programming. So basically we just showed, ah, okay, so, the running time of this algorithm is n cubed. I should have asked you guys before I showed it to you, but you can you can see pretty clearly that you go from one to n, and then all pairs u v. You can imagine doing that as like one to n, and then one to n. So this is n cubed running time, and then the space. Uh, it turns out you don't need to keep all of the d. You don't need to keep k zero when you are computing k five. You only need K4. 
so the space as you can so in the implementation in talking about it we keep everything but when you actually implement it you only need the last two piece okay let's skip this so here's an interesting question so hopefully you guys understand this algorithm if not i encourage you to look at it it's a very very interesting dynamic programming Bellman forward, you can come up with the same argument. Bottom up, it's really easy to implement. It's three, four loops, right? So usually dynamic programming algorithms are very easy to write. It is hard to come up with them and it is hard to know that they work, right? Because I just told you the algorithm and you guys are still like, I don't know, does that work? Does that actually work? What is it doing? Does that make sense, right? So they're hard. Uh, can we do better than O of n cubed? What do you guys think? So this is actually an interesting question. There is an algorithm that runs O of n cubed divided by log to the 100 of n. Okay, this is a very, very complicated algorithm that uses matrix theory to try to improve the O of n cubed. This is currently the fastest known algorithm for this problem. Yeah. I have no idea what this algorithm is. It is like a research algorithm. Nobody uses it. Like super complicated. The mathematics needed to understand why it works are like too high level for us mere mortals that just write code. Like, well, they're trying to figure out. So this is what it's called. It's called faster all short. This is the name of the paper. They invented it in 2014 and it uses circuit complexity to get this running time. So I don't know how that works. I could not explain to you, but if you're interested, you can look up the paper. But I think the point to make is that if you can come up with an algorithm that runs faster than n to the 2.99, then you should hit me up because we've got a research paper to write and we've got some money to get and some fame to come to. Because this is actually the fastest known algorithm. And you'll notice like this log factor, log factors don't help that much. It's actually not that much faster, it's like barely faster, right? Um, yes. But surprisingly, uh, there is a conjecture that if you were to be able to come up with a faster algorithm, then uh, you would be able to solve a lot of very difficult problems in cryptography. So we're actually gonna cover this towards the end of the class, like how coming up with faster algorithms can actually just destroy the, like, the world economy. But the idea, it, most people believe you cannot do faster than this. That is the current belief. Nobody has proven you cannot do faster polynomially than n cubed. So most people believe this is impossible. What we have shown is that if you could do faster, so if you could get all pair shortest paths at the running time of n to the squared or n 2.99 or whatever, then basically you would be able to like break into everybody's bank accounts and like everything would break because you would show that, yeah, it, it would break a lot of stuff. So most people think that's not the case. We're gonna talk about more towards the end of lecture. Okay. But let's jump to a new problem. So we've got 10 minutes to cover this one. So here's another dynamic programming problem that maybe it's a little easier for you guys to understand. It does not use graphs. So let's try to think about it. So here's a pretty common question that you actually ask in biological science. This, uh, what is it called? Rabbit, toad, no, uh, frog. <laughs> and this other frog, sorry, I just thought it was linked out. Uh, <laughs> you can imagine that you can, so you guys remember from biology, you have DNA, you have your like basis, ATCG, right, or whatever. You can write down their DNA sequence. And one question that you might ask to try to figure out how closely related the two species are is what is the longest common subsequence? Okay, so I'm going to define what that means. In this case, the longest common subsequence between this one and this one is this. Don't worry if you don't see it right now. I'm actually going to define it in the next slide. So, longest common subsequence. Sequence. It's three words. So you need to understand each word. Subsequence. Subsequence. This is a subsequence of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. B, D, F, H is a subsequence. So subsequence means the letters are in the same order. That's it. Okay. Yeah. uh we are just trying to define i'm trying to introduce these terms to you and define them we actually haven't gotten to the problem yet but 
um, essentially what you might have is if you have a string, a subsequence of that string, it's a string that has the same characters in the same order, but not necessarily all of the characters. So, you know, it does not have A, but it has B, it does not have C, but it has D. So they're in the same order, but they're not necessarily all of them. That's just a subsequence. Okay. So, um, this is useful because you can imagine like if the if the if the subsequence if you take a subsequence of this and a subsequence of this if the longest common subsequence between the two is very long then these two dna you know strings are very close to each other right they share a lot of the same letters in the same order so this is like in in biology you can talk to somebody that does bioinformatics this is a very common problem Essentially, like they're trying to figure out how similar two species are. And the way they solve it is they say, well, write out the DNA sequence in letters, and then write out the DNA sequence of another animal in letters. And then if they share a lot of the same letters in the same order, then they, they're probably very closely related. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that is this problem of longest common subsequence. So again, if X and Y are sequences, a common subsequence is a sequence which is a subsequence of both, right? So that's just common means that it is a subsequence of both X and Y. There's an example. And then the longest common subsequence is out of all the subsequences that are common, what is the longest one, right? Uh, we sometimes want to find these. So like I said, this is useful in biology, but in a lot of other applications, it's useful. Bioinformatics, let's skip a lot of this application stuff. But it turns out that this problem can be solved using dynamic programming as well. Okay, so why? Yeah, we don't have a ton of time, but I'll just go through it. So again, this is the recipe for dynamic programming, okay? Step one is you want to find optimal substructure. So the problem is given two strings, what is the longest common subsequence, okay? This is the hard part of dynamic programming. You have to sit down and think, how can I break this up into smaller problems that then I can also use to give me the answer to the bigger problem? So what's like a natural way to try to break this pro problem into smaller problems? So if I give you two strings and I say, give me the longest common subsequence of these two strings, what might be some ideas you guys are like, are like, how do I, how do I make that a smaller problem? Yeah. Sorry. Could you speak up a little bit? Right. So one idea would be like, well, let's make this string smaller. Right. Right. So instead of what's the longest common subsequence of X and Y, you could say, what's the longest common subsequence of the first half of X and the second half, right? That's actually not what you use, but that is like something you should think about, right? How do you make it smaller? The next step is you find a recursive formulation for the length of the longest common subsequence, right? So you find a way to take your answers to the smaller problems to solve the bigger problem, right? So that's recursion. Then step three is you use dynamic programming. Once you have the recursive formulation, you can just write it as a dynamic program. And then step four and five, we're not going to cover too much, but step four is sometimes you need to keep track of extra information. Step five is you actually have to code it up, right? All right, so let's do it for this problem. Let's first identify the optimal substructure. So somebody suggested I can look at smaller versions of my strings. That is the right track, actually. How do you make the strings smaller? Somebody suggested we can cut them in half. That won't work. Somebody have other suggestions? And this is the part, yeah, you use substring, but how do you make the, you, you have to give me a very clear definition of given X, how do you wanna make it smaller? Do you take off the first letter? Do you take off the last letter? Do you, do you find the middle, split it in half? Okay, so find the middle, split it in half doesn't work. This is the kind of thing that people spend a lot of time doing research because all of these ideas are good. Most of them don't work. So the one that does work is we're gonna use prefixes. This works, okay? So again, you shouldn't know this, right? It shouldn't be obvious because you haven't seen a lot of dynamic programming. 
that this will be an optimal sub problem. But all of your ideas were like, oh, let's make it shorter some way. It turns out that if you make it shorter by looking at the prefixes of the string, that is a good sub problem to solve. Okay. So our sub problems are going to be this. So given that you're trying to find the longest common subsequence of X and Y, I am going to find the longest common subsequence of XI and YJ. Okay. So this is just syntax. This is syntax where XI says go all the way from the beginning to the ith character. YJ means go all the way from the beginning of Y to the J character. So Y zero is just A. Or let's say Y one, just A. Y, this is Y four, one, two, three, four. So A, C, G, C is Y four, okay? So we're just introducing syntax. That's what that means, okay? In code, you would actually have to do indexes. You'd have to substring it. You'd have to do something, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna one index in this case. Apologies for switching the indices on you guys. But again, all of this is just notation. You wanna take away the idea. Because when you actually implement it, you're not gonna use subscripts in C++, right? You're gonna use dot substring from zero to I, right? Or you know something like that. Um, so this is the optimal substructure, okay? So now I've given you the optimal substructure. Given this, you guys should be able to come up with how do I take two smaller answers to give me a bigger answer? No, 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 no. We're th this is just an example of like Y four, but in general, we're actually going to look at all of the prefixes. Yeah. So we're going to say we're going to have a we're going to create a two D matrix, and we're going to say C I J is going to be the length of the longest common subsequence of X I and Y J. So C zero zero is going to be what is the longest common subsequence of A and A. Right, because it's it's only going to look at a, only going to look at a, or c one one, c one one. Sorry, we we're one index. Yeah. Uh, it is going to go up to psi. So again, this is this case, it's their one index, but the way you when you implement it, it might be different. But for the lecture slide, i starts at one, j starts at one. Yeah, and then they go all the way up to whatever the length of Y is, which we call M, I think, and the length of X, which is N. This is, uh, this is defining the sub problem. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, we're gonna say, how do I compute IJ using answers to I minus one and J minus one? That's the next step because those are smaller sub problems, right? So it's going to say, how do I get the answer to the longest common subsequence of four using the answer to the longest common subsequence of V, like four and three, and then three and four. So if you know the answer to those, so if I told you the answer to, so let's say I'm trying to compute, oh my God, marker is bad, whatever. I'm trying to compute I equal four, J equal four, okay? I want to know the longest common subsequence of this part and this part. So this is ignored, you're not looking at this, okay? And what I'm telling you is, if you knew the answer to I equal three, J equal four, and I equal four, J equal three, and I equal three, J equal three, so if you knew the answer to these, you already know it. Somebody gave it to you. Somebody told you. Can you easily compute the answer to this one? That's the question. Okay. So if I knew the longest common subsequence between ACGG and ACG, and I knew ACGC and ACG and ACG and ACG, like if I knew those answers, can I combine them in a way to give me the answer to this one? uh let's keep going let's finish up this problem well I, you guys probably have a class it's 12 50. what do you want to do do you want to think about this so i do think that you have enough information in this slide 
in the example I've given you, where I think if you sit down and try to think through this problem, you will figure out a way to compute ij given you have the answers to all the smaller ones. Okay. And again, you're trying to find the longest subsequence. So you're going to be taking a max of some stuff. And there's only a couple of options. Okay. All right. So we're going to pause it there. And then I will record this for Monday. I guess we'll continue. And maybe I'll go over it again on Wednesday. Um, but yeah, that is. Yeah, you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. All right, folks on Zoom, I'm going to exit. Thanks for coming.